Good morning, everyone. Can you guys hear me? Yep. All right. Yep. So my name is Alvin Marguise. I'm a second-year family medicine resident from Ellis Hospital. Uh, it's about 165 miles north of New York City. Uh, I'll be doing a literature review and case report on a perimortem cesarean delivery that we performed. I have, as a poor resident, I have nothing to disclose of financial interest or commercial uh, things in this presentation. The things that I want to focus on are discuss about the risk factors, the indications and guidelines regarding uh, such a procedure. Uh, what are we trying to accomplish here? And also, what makes the gravid patient a little different in, during resuscitation compared to a, a normal adult? Uh, so the main thing is the aerial cable compression here. As you can see, um, the rarity is fairly um, prominent. It's 1 in 20,000 to 50,000 pregnancies. Um, reports have shown that most of the causes range from pulmonary embolism to uh, hemorrhage. Uh, and we'll, we'll be presenting a case regarding a patient who presented in uh, pulseless electrical activity. So roughly about a year ago, a 41-year-old female, uh, G6P3, she was about 35 weeks of gestational age. Came, um, apparently she was at home. She was clutching her abdomen, collapsed to the floor. Uh, she had complained about some belly pain and then became unresponsive. Her family members called EMS right away. Upon arrival, uh, EMS found her to be in PEA and she was intubated on the field and brought over to our hospital. Uh, just to give you guys some background information regarding her prenatal history, uh, she was uh, she was seen uh, roughly about a week ago by her OBGYN, and she was found to be a little hypertensive. Uh, she was started on labetrol, uh, but there were no signs and symptoms of uh, preeclampsia. A quick bedside ultrasound went up on arrival and showed that there was no uh, fetal cardiac activity, but there was some minimal maternal cardiac activity. And uh, with the hopes that we can potentially salvage the mom, um, using the entitled CO2s, which are consistently in about the 20s and uh, mid-20s, uh, we decided to proceed with the procedure. So keep in mind that this is all being done in the trauma room in the emergency department. Um, and the incision time that we were able to accomplish was about three minutes uh, from upon arrival. So upon uh, entry to the uterus, we noted that there was a lot of blood, a large amount of blood that was pouring out of the uterus. Uh, we immediately evacuated the uh, non myable fetus, handed it over uh, to a neonatologist uh, who was able to evaluate the, the fetus. Um, upon evacuation, was the, uh, we were able to establish return of spontaneous circulation. At that moment, uh, we did start the patient on epidrip, uh, saline, and um, you know, these things were helping her. Uh, however, uh, the bleeding was still fairly prominent and the uterine, uterus still kept on bleeding despite packing, despite pressure, um, and we we're also using you know, uterine tonic agents like misoprostol and methogen. Um, and we also started her on massive transfusion protocol, um, which could just give you an idea, we used about 13 units of PRBCs, uh, three units of cryo, seven units of FFP, and uh, roughly two units of platelets. Regardless, um, she kept on uh, hemorrhaging and um, the PE actually came back. Um, so at that point, you know, we, we decided that since the uterus was so boggy uh, and it wasn't firming up, we decided to proceed with a hysterectomy in the emergency department. Um, uh, we were able to have, lucky enough to have guidance support right away. And um, at that moment of doing, finishing up the hysterectomy, we were able to maintain um, return of spontaneous circulation at that point. And once we you know, controlled the bleeding, we were able to transport her to ICU um, and her hemodynamics were maintained on pressors. Um, just another thing to keep in mind is that during this whole procedure, she didn't require any sort of sedation, any sort of, um, she didn't have any sort of motor activity, she wasn't responding to any of the pain, things like that. And I also want you to keep in mind that during this whole event, CPR was being done. So you can imagine the organized chaos that was being um, done in the trauma room. Um, during her ICU course, despite of her efforts, uh, she remained comatose. And on day three, we decided, after discussing things with the family members, we decided to make her uh, comfortable and withdraw support. Um, 
just to give you guys some historical facts, uh, no one really knows when the first one was done, but it's, studies have shown that it may have been in the first times in Egypt in about 3000 BC, sometimes in India, in, apparently around 600 BC, but most note, um, notably is known for King Henry VIII and his wife Jane Seymour. The legend goes that Jane Seymour was in labor for about two days and she was having a very difficult time and her doctor offered either a craniotomy, which doesn't make sense, and also an abdominal delivery. Um, so King Henry VIII, who was desperate for a son, decided to proceed with a abdominal delivery and he famously said, save the life of the child for another wife can be easily found. So. Um, Dr. Katz, who is considered the guru of um, perimortem deliveries, he researched um, 269 cases uh, from 1879 to 1985, and of those, 61, uh, we knew the time interval. And with those, uh, he made the recommendation that we should try to proceed with the five-minute cutoff. Um, the problem with that is that, you know, of these cases, there's obviously unreporting of uh, unsuccessful cases. Uh, however, he did update his work in about 2005 uh, where he looked at more cases and again supported the recommendation that you should proceed with a five minute cutoff. Uh, the goal of the five minutes is to evacuate the, uter uh, the, evacuate the fetus out of the uterus and the incision time should be about four minutes. So as you can see, um, the normal infants which are considered uh, infants without any neurological damage are eight out of 11. So that, that was the golden standard at that point. Um, so, is it, is it, you know, how feasible is it to do a five minute uh, cutoff? So the idea is you do five minutes from cardiac arrest. So if the patient arrests and, you know, goes down, the goal is to, you start the timer, um, you prep the belly just in case that this is, this might or may not happen and you don't want to do any delays. So, the conclusion is that you, you want to do it as early as possible than later because there are reports out there that show that there are infants um, even at 10 minutes that were evacuated uh, turned out to be fine. But the American Heart Association and um, obstetrics, ACOG, they all recommend the five minute cutoff. But how feasible is this? Um, there are ways you can avoid delays. For instance, you don't want to do um, an ultrasound for too long to uh, look for fetal movement or you know, things like that. You want to do it as quick as possible. Um, you don't want to delay by transporting the patient to the OR. Studies have shown that patients who were transported to the OR actually did a lot worse. You know, this is not a sterile procedure. Um, this, this is, you know, you, the point is to do it as quick as possible. The other thing that I want to focus on is the aortal cable compression. This is why the pregnant female is different than uh, and normal adult resuscitation. As you can see, uh, there are two different ways you can displace the uterus off the, uh, off the vessels. Um, there's a manual uh, left uterine displacement and there's also a tilt uh, you can, where you can tilt the whole table. But, you know, the idea is to provide um, strong compressions and most providers who have done this procedure have noted that the left manual uterine displacement is much easier and much more feasible to do it rather than tilt the whole table. So when do you do this? Do you do this on a 10-week uh, gestational age uh, female or do you do this on a 24? Uh, the recommendation is to do it on the 24. Uh, but keep in mind, sometimes you can have a 20-weeker, uh, but with multiple gestations and you know, twins and polyhydramnios, we can all, which can all impact the vessels. Um, so at that point, you still, you know, you, again, you don't want to waste time assessing uh, what her gestational age would be. You want to look at the uterus, see where the fundus is, and then go from there. So in summary, there are three rules that I want you guys to take home with. Uh, 24, because that's roughly the gestational age that where the vessels are being affected and where you can't um, provide uh, efficient car CPR and where cardiac output is being diminished. The second, um, number two, is two in instruments. All you need is a scalpel to make an incision from the pubic symphysis to cipher process and um, a scissors to cut through the uterus. And five is the five minute cutoff from cardiac arrest to uh, evacuation of the, of the fetus. Um, keep in mind that the incision time should be at four minutes.